It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. This radio program and podcast is dedicated to highlighting the stories of small businesses, the true backbone of the American economy. We are excited to have in, in studio today Blair and Daryl Hornbacher with Midas Financial. Welcome to the studio. Thank Hi. you for having us. Yeah, excited to have you guys in the studio. We, uh, For our listeners, we connected on LinkedIn. Uh, and for our listeners, if you don't use LinkedIn in your business as a way to grow your business, I would recommend that you do so. Um, just reaching out, whether it's me reaching out to you guys or you guys reaching out to me, just that opportunity to connect with other business owners is important for all of us. And so, you know, the fact that we connected on LinkedIn, I think, is is great. And then we had an initial call to get to know one another. Uh, and you guys have a, a very unique story, right? Um, before we jump into the side of the story that talks about your business, though, we always ask our guests to tell a little bit about themselves personally, right? So we'd love to hear your family story. I know you guys are kind of a blended family in, in a way. And so, you know, Daryl, maybe you start. Tell us a little bit about your family, and then you guys can talk about how you came together. And we'll Yeah, jump in after sure. I, I grew up in rural Michigan. Um, <clears throat> not poor, but not wealthy by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, 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 the basic family, mom and dad, were together forever until death did them part. And I uh, have four brothers and sisters. And, uh, yeah, we had a real Capri-esque, leave-it-to-beaver childhood. and uh, But Michigan was Michigan, and I wanted to move. And I, you know, right out of school, I moved and moved and moved. And finally, 35 years later, settled here in Arizona um, with stints in Minneapolis, Birmingham, Washington, D.C., uh, uh, Denver. And, yeah, so that's, that's in a nutshell. Finally, finally made your way here to the Valley of the oh, Sun. Gosh, I had a chance to move here with my first job out of college in 1983, and I chose Minnesota instead. <laughs> and, and I drive down where we live in, in Gilbert, rural East Valley, um, is very palm tree-ish, if that makes sense. And when you drive down the boulevard, you just see all these palm trees. And every time I drive down, I'm like, gosh, I live here. It's, it's just amazing, you know. Yeah, well, as a resident of Gilbert, I can certainly second how great it is to live in the town of Gilbert. Yeah. yeah. So, Blair, tell us, tell us your story. Yeah, so I'm actually a native of Arizona. I... I say I'm a third generation. My husband says five. I guess it depends on who you ask. But my father and my grandfather were both, both born here as well. Uh, I grew up right in Arcadia near Camelback Mountain, went to Arcadia High School. Um, I have, a, like I said, a long family history. In fact, <laughs> my family's, my maiden name is Porter. And my family, a lot of people may be familiar with the Porter's Western Wear, which was kind of an iconic store here in the Valley. My grandfather actually started that. He, uh, the first store was started in the 1940s in downtown Phoenix. And our claim to fame is that the first escalator in the entire state of Arizona was in Porter's Western Wear in downtown. Wow. So, Wow, that's an interesting claim right? to fame. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun facts. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, and I can tell you for sure that the Porter name here in the Valley is huge. So yeah. I'm sure you have a lot of cousins here, many that you may not even know. That's probably very true, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Any, any children for you? Yeah, so I have a daughter who, named Morgan who's 14 and a half, and she is my daughter, Daryl's stepdaughter. Daryl's raised her since she was about three years old, so Daryl's really, you know, dad. Um, and then we have a believe it or not, a 20-month-old. Uh, so we have a little gap in between there, but it's super fun, and they both keep me on my toes and pull me different directions. So <laughs> yeah. it's really great. It's great. It's really fun. 
Yeah, no, I think that's great. I so I was raised by my stepfather as well, so I can connect with with that and, and understanding, you know, the value of a stepfather that really understands what they can bring to the table. Um, don't know a ton about your relationship prior to to this relationship, but knowing that a stepdad can step in and help raise children is is a big deal, especially to a guy like me that that did that. My parents were divorced when I was uh, about three years old. Um, I still have a semi relationship with my biological father, but it's been, I mean, I saw him for the first time at a, at a wedding in maybe three years I, in January is when I saw him. So, I, we, you know, we don't have much of a relationship. My stepfather really did raise me. I call him dad. I don't know if that's the case here, but you know, it, a dad is somebody who's there to help kids learn and grow and learn the important lessons in life. And so you know, hats off to you for, for stepping in and doing that. I appreciate it. It's uh, when when I, I have three older children um, from my first marriage, and uh, I never got to see them because I was traveling. I was a traveling salesperson, and I was gone 51 weeks out of the year. And so I never got to see them grow up. And when I met Blair and, and Morgan was part of the package, I'm like, okay, this is going to be interesting. But I... I got to see what I never experienced with my own children right out of the gate. So it was it was interesting. It was eye-opening. Uh, I'm not sure she'll call me. She calls me dad right now. She's a 14-year-old girl, and, you know, I, I don't think I need to say any more about that. It's a love-hate thing probably, but, uh, uh, she, she, yeah, she's a great person, and I love her to death, as, and I've treated her as my own since the very first day. So Yeah. Well, I've got a teenage daughter, so trust me, I, I know exactly. You understand. <laughs> I, I have two kids. My son's 21, just turned 21, and he's uh, finishing his sophomore year at ASU right now. And then my daughter's going to graduate high school from Highland High School there in Gilbert uh, this May, next month. Oh, good so, for her. Yeah, so we're excited to get her off to, to school. She's excited to get out of the house and kind of, you know, spread her wings and, and do her own thing. And, and she's ready. Um, you know, I think high school seniors aren't always as mature as we would like them to be, right. but I think when they're given the opportunity to, to do it on their own, they tend to figure it out. So we're, we're excited for her to be able to do that. So let's jump in and talk a little bit about Midas Financial, specifically, Blair, how you came to be part of Midas Financial. Um, I'll just tell you, your, your background is pretty similar to mine mm -hmm. in that what you studied in college is very different than what you do in real life, right? So I have an undergraduate degree in French, and now I manage people's money and help them, <laughs> you know, build their businesses and eventually sell them. So obviously about as far as you could be from from the French language, you studied political science. So, you know, you're kind of the face of, of the business now. So how has that uh, come about? And, and, you know, just give us that history. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, like you said, I graduated from University of Maryland with a double major, actually political science and also Spanish. So just similar to the French, but not quite. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and my original intention was to go to law school. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I ended up on the East Coast. Oh, it's the central, you know, D.C. I was five miles outside of D.C. Great location. You know, for a girl that grew up here and never really left, that was, I wanted to spread my wings, just like we, you said you want, you know, for your daughter. Yeah. So I did. I had a great experience in college. Um, you know, ended up just, my first job, I ended up in Boston. I worked at a procure procurement department, excuse me, uh, in buying. And really it, what happened was it was right, I graduated right after 9-11. And uh, there weren't too many opportunities. Um, and I, I just wasn't quite sure if I was ready for law school yet. So I just kind of wanted to go and experience w the world and life and, and a job. And so that's, I ended up in Boston. And like I said, and that's, uh, that was my first experience. And then, you know, I think sales is just, in my bones, sales and, and, and finance. My, my father was in extremely successful in commercial real estate here in the Valley um, and all over the country. And I grew up just being around him and seeing him and, and I just learned from him and it, it just kind of morphed into a passion for sales. I sold uh, life insurance for a while in Texas and after a, you know quite a while I ended up in Denver and that's where my husband and I met um, and how I, how Daryl and I met, actually, we met on Facebook, quite honestly, which was, you know, a lot of people think it's pretty funny. Back then in 2010, 
it wasn't quite as common as it is now. Uh, but we had connected, we had mutual friends, um, and I at the time was going through a pretty rough divorce. Um, I was a stay-at-home mom. My daughter, Morgan, that we spoke about was at the time about two. And, this, and it, the process of that divorce was a long process. It wasn't simple. We hadn't been married that long, but it just, you know how divorces can go. Um, long story short, my ex-husband cut off ac access to my bank accounts, uh, stopped paying my bills or our bills, and I, my house ended up getting foreclosed on. Like I said, I was a stay-at-home mom at the time because that was important to me to be home with my daughter when she was little. And uh, yeah, so I ended up filing bankruptcy. Um, my credit got destroyed, obviously. It, I could have actually gone to my father and asked him to bail me out, and I just made the decision. I said to myself, you know what, you're a grown up, and you need to do this on your own and learn from your mistakes and you know, figure it out. So that's what I did. So anyways, Daryl and I got connected. I reached out to him to do, um, see if he, 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 I knew he was a credit, personal credit expert, and to, uh, you know, I was asking him questions about if he could help me or point me in the right direction. Uh, and in fact, back then there was not nearly as much information available uh, on credit and how it worked. There still isn't a lot. It's not taught in schools. It's really sad, actually, because most people have no concept or understanding uh, of how it works, either whether they have good credit or bad credit. But so Daryl reached out or helped me do that. And then he also, I was in m doing marketing, some sales and marketing for another company. and. Uh, Daryl had asked me if I was interested in, you know, coming along for to do, to help with the company to do some marketing for him. <laughs> so I'll never forget. I, we we kind of we our schedules didn't match for a while. We we were connected. We talk on the phone, just you know, business wise. And finally, I, it was Memorial Day weekend, and I finally s I said, my my daughter's going to her nana's house for the for the weekend to spend the night. Do you want to get together and talk business? I've got free time. He said absolutely. So I, I told my mom that I was going to meet a gentleman that I met off of Facebook for a, a job opportunity. And of course, you know, that on oh Saturday of Memorial Day yeah. weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And she says, oh, he's a serial, you know, serial killer or whatnot. I said, I think I'll be OK. We're going to meet at Panera Bread, broad daylight. Everything will be good. So, yeah. So anyways, that was the um, beginning of how I became involved. And from my my personal experience is one of the reasons why I'm so incredibly passionate about financial literacy and personal credit and all those things. And then it just was, you know, a perfect match. Um, I, I came on board. I started working with the company. And then eventually I married my boss. And here we are. <laughs> <laughs> so it did, the Facebook connection did start out business, not personal. Yes, yes. And absolutely. And it became more. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it's certainly more common today to connect on Facebook for business or personal right. reasons, right? I mean, as a as a father of a 21-year-old, the online dating world is, is m well, it was non-existent when I got married. I got married 22, 23 years ago, um, and so I haven't dated since, of course, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's huge. Yeah. It's huge, yeah. It's definitely different now than it was even 11 years ago. Yeah. So... Yeah, no, I think that's a cool story, and obviously, uh, over time, you guys realized that there was more than, than just business involved, and, and now it's turned into a, a personal relationship as well, and, you know, I'll just, you guys seem to make it work. My wife and I worked together the first six months that we were married, and <laughs> it wasn't my company, it wasn't our company, we worked for somebody else, mm -hmm. um, but pretty soon afterwards, I was put in a leadership position over her, and it did not go <laughs> well, so... <laughs> It, uh, I'm glad to see some people can make it work, but it would not, it would not go well in our family. Yeah. I mean, we definitely have our moments, but for the most part, it works pretty seamlessly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I spent some time on your website, and one of the things that I saw on there that stuck out to me was that you, you are the oldest unsecured loan broker in the country, Daryl. So tell us a little bit about that and, and uh, yeah. how we're able to... So, so interesting story. Um, prior to Midas, which we, which I founded on uh, yesterday, 17 years ago on the 5th of, of April, um, I was a serial entrepreneur, um, and I would buy and sell businesses. Now, let's n make no mistake, I wasn't T. Boone Pickens or, or anything like that, uh, but 
I got fired from both of the jobs I had for insubordination. And my grandmother one day came to me and she said, now what are you going to do? And I'm like, well, I'm going to find another job. And she's like, you don't need a job. You need to go do what you're on your own. And uh, she said, I'll stake you the money. There's a little dry cleaning store that, that we can buy that I'll stake you the money and, and uh, we can buy it really cheap and, and you can run it and pay me back and that'll be your life. Well, that wasn't my life, you know, but it was my life for a year and uh, I got in there and fixed it. And, fit and set the books up, set the marketing of it, you know, all things on a very small scale. And we paid 30 grand for the business, and I ended up selling it for 60 after 11 months. And, you know, back then in the 1980s, that was a whole bunch of money, you yeah. know. And uh, so I went on and did that uh, 11 more times successfully. I did it another time and crashed and burned. Um, but I still, my record was pretty good. And I would just go and I would buy these businesses. I would fix what was broken and then sell them. And um, the one constant there always was, was the need for capital. And this is why we're so ingrained in what we do. Now we understand first person, the importance of capital to a small business owner or lack thereof. So um, my, on just before I started Midas, I owned a uniform rental company with my brother and things. The, the business was going great, uh, but our relationship had soured and we decided to sell it and go our different ways. Well, we were able to sell it. They, they wanted uh, or somebody had offered us like a half a million bucks, you know, not a lot of money, but a good chunk of money in 19 or in 2001 and uh, or 2002 they they offered us a half a million bucks but if we had one piece of equipment uh, basically a, a washing machine that's as big as this room that we're in we could have doubled our revenue and therefore doubled the sales price and this this piece of equipment was a lousy hundred grand so we went to the bank and um, they, the, and, and we both had 800 credit scores. We both owned our houses outright. We both had $100,000 cars that were paid for. And the bank said, no, unless you secure it. And um, we were like, yeah. Well, actually, we both had wives that are different than my wife now. <laughs> but uh, and our wives were the ones that said, no, you're not, no. So we were literally sitting in the office deciding to take the deal, and a young lady walked in and said, um, I sell money. And we still use, that's a huge statement in our business right now. We coined that phrase, or we, we stole it from her. She's not in the business anymore, so she doesn't care. Um, but uh, she says, I sell money. Are you interested? And we're saying, and we said, yeah, but we already got turned down by the bank. And long story short she says here fill out this application sign your name and sign this fee agreement for two percent um of you know so if i get you a hundred grand you'll pay me two thousand little did she know i would have paid her ten thousand sure. right uh so i just kept my mouth shut we signed she said i'll be back in 72 hours and i'll have a checkbook for you in 48 hours she came back and she had uh uh, the checkbook and it had 125,000 bucks in it. All I had to do was sign the papers. We used it. We bought the piece of equipment. We turned around, sold the business, and now I'm twiddling my thumb, saying I have, I have money in my pocket. What am I going to do now? Because I'm really tired of the constant turnover. And uh, so I went back to this young lady and I said, "Look it." I don't want to rain on your parade, but you've also, I had recommended two or three of my buddies to her that were business owners, and she got a money. So this is in 2003, which was the start of unsecured lending as we know it today. And I said, I just want to learn what you do. I want to do it. And she says, funny thing, I'm pregnant. My husband doesn't want me to work, so give me another 3000 bucks." And I'll teach you everything I know. And boom, Midas was started. And within six months, we had six offices around the country and 100 salespeople. And we were just killing it until the crash. And, uh, you know, I always, and, and one of the things is, as, you know, Blair talked about the single mom, I've always had a, a 
concern for single moms out there. And, and they're, by and large, very trustworthy, very honest, very transparent, and very hard workers. They have no choice but to be hard workers. So when Midas was at its top in, in the fall of 2007, um, we had 73 employees, salespeople, and 72 were single moms. And they killed it. They were all making six figures, which back then was, you know, making one hundred twenty five, hundred thirty thousand dollars a year was it was big money. Yeah. You know, so that's kind of where it started. And um, along the way, we became experts at credit because credit is the juggernaut of, of finance. If you you know, if you're not perfectly prepared, you're you're just not going to get what you need to get. So, yeah, that's that's pretty much the story of how the company started. Yeah, it's a unique story, but uh, I can see how, you know, how it kind of came together and uh, you've been able to take it and grow it, right? I mean, that's what you've done 11 or 12 times over, taking a business. It's doing okay, but you take it to another level. But I also understand not wanting to be on the merry-go-round yeah. any longer, right? So let's go to Blair. So you just told us it's all about business finance and credit, but for our listeners and for, for your listeners, I mean, what is it exactly that you guys do as an organization? Right. So like Daryl said, uh, we were the, we are the oldest unsecured loan broker in the country. Uh, and the unsecured portion of the business that we do accounts for about 25% of all the money that's out there in the marketplace today for small business owners. So that's a huge portion of our business, but that's not all we do. Um, over time and over you know the 17 years, we've expanded from that to basically offer everything, right? So we have a lender list of over 900 lenders. Um, it does on the private side and on you know the debt related, and we do $50,000 all the way up to, right now we have a $100 million deal that we're working on and everything in between. And why the reason why people will come to us, well, a lot of times, unfortunately, they've been to multiple banks and already gotten turned down, just like Daryl had said. Uh, so unfortunately, that happens a lot. But a lot of times, people will come to us from the get-go. The reason being is because we're very consultative. And so we take the business owner, we dig, and we dig really deep, and we get them to understand you know, and look at the full picture. A lot of times, business owners will come to us thinking that they need one thing regarding their finances or you know I, they need this to grow or expand when really they really need to go down a completely different path. And so where we come in is we're the matchmaker. So we can go to our lenders um, we can and we can take the client and we can look at, okay, here's where this person needs to go. Here's the path that we've mutually decided is in their best interest and we're gonna hook them up, so to speak, with this particular lender. And so that's why people come to us and, and they will pay us. Now, it depends on the situation. Sometimes people, the client pays us, depending on what, you know, sometimes the br or the uh, bank will pay us and sometimes it's a combination. So it really just depends on, on what that looks like. But we're very good at it. And again, it's not just the unsecured, but we do everything from, you know, SBA loan packaging. Um, we do equipment leasing. We do hard money, so there's a lot of, especially in Arizona and you know even nationwide, a lot of fix and flip uh, happening, and you know commercial real estate things of that nature. So we have avenues and and ways to get money for for people that are in, in that field. Um, you know factoring. Um, we even we have a, a process that we call the Midas Continuum, and what that is is that a lot of times we'll get business owners that will come to us and they'll say, well, s they'll say, I need money. Okay, great, how much do you need? You know, it's round numbers, they need $100,000. Okay, when do you need it by? I needed it by yesterday, <laughs> <laughs> right? So, you know, most of the time, and, and then I'll say, okay, what's your personal credit score? And it's 600. Well, in a business, if you don't, if you have below a 680 on the business loan side, you're just not getting money unless, and if you do get money, it's going to be at a very high interest rate. Right. So we came up with a, a program, if you will, called the Midas Continuum. So what we will do is we will we'll say, okay, we can get you this money, um, and we can get it to you fast. A lot of times it can happen in 48 to 72 business hours, if you will, and 
but you're not going to like the interest rate more than likely. I mean, it's going to be almost predatory. But see, the difference between us at Midas and a lot of other people that are in our, sp our space, we, don't, we won't put a client into that type of loan, a predatory loan, unless we have a pathway for them to get out of that. Because what happens is a lot of times business owners are desperate. They're trying to stay afloat and stay solvent. They'll get sold one of these very high interest loans and then they never hear from the broker or the company that sold them the loan again and they end up going under anyways because they can't p make the payments and so not only do they lose their business but then they have this huge debt hanging over their head. So when we give them a path, we'll say, okay, we'll get you the money. The first thing you're gonna do is enroll in our credit restoration program where we help them to legally remove negative items from their credit reports and then also add positively uh, reporting line items, primary trade lines. And so it's a perfect storm. And so we can get a lot of times, uh, we average about 120 days. Um, and ev every file is different, every client's different, obviously. But w and if they can continue those payments in three to four months during that time and maintain that, then once we get their credit up where it needs to be, then we can refi them into a loan that's long-term, sustainable, and they and then they can you know they can get out of the the sh the uh, predatory loan. Their credit's now in a much better situation. We've educated them and taught them you know let's not have this happen again. And then they're in a much better position going forward. Yeah, no, I think they they end up getting stuck in this rut, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing on the individual side with these uh, check cashing places or the payday loan type of scenarios, right? Where you're desperate, you can get it quickly. You go in and get it, and you pay some obscene interest rate. And what you pay back, by the time you pay it back, you need another loan because you just were overextended. And so then you take another loan. And you just never, ever get out of that rut. You and can't. I, yeah. yeah. Daryl has a story about a client <laughs> that did that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> we. I mean, these we stay out of it. It's a dirty and greasy business. But there are times where we'll put uh, a client into it. But only, as, as Blair said, only if we already have a predetermined path to get out of it. Uh, and, you know, we do that on a daily basis. And, you know, sadly, especially with what we've lived through the, the last 18 months or so, um, you know, the, a lot of people are in that position. And the biggest thing about her, the most unfortunate thing is, you know, whenever there's money involved, the wolves and the vultures come out of the corners, you know, and there's a lot of them out there. Um, we've maintained an almost perfect reputation uh, over the years simply because we're, we're integrity driven and transparent in everything we do. We've walked away from hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in commissions with these predatory loans um, just because of the damage it would do to our reputation. We weren't going to allow that. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're just, we're more of a traditional, uh, we think outside the box and, and match that thinking with traditional credit facilities that, you know, business owners need. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes it just takes stepping back and being consultative with the clients, right? Even, even in our business, I mean, we've got a junior advisor that's part of our team, Landon and I's team, and he's, he's learning and growing, and, you know, he's taken the Series, he has already taken the Series 7 mm -hmm. and, and has had it for a couple of years now. But, um, he, you know, we were talking through a scenario with him where he's got a client that has a certain amount of money and wants that certain amount of money to guarantee a certain stream of income for the rest of his life. Right the certain amount of money that he has isn't anywhere near yeah. the <laughs> amount of money that he needs yeah. to guarantee the stream of income that he wants, right? Right. And a lot of advisors will just say, oh, you're looking for, you know, whatever, an annuity? I'll sell you that annuity. And that's just, that's not consultative. It's let's get to the root of what it is that you need. Mm -hmm. Let's build a plan that works for you, not just you telling me what you think you want, and I'm going to sell it to you because there's a commission that's paid on the other side. And there are plenty of advisors that will do that. There are plenty of people in your industry that will do that, but it's to the detriment of, of, the, com exactly. of the client. Yeah, and to, to the, what you, the point that you made about the payday loans and then you need another payday loan. You know, my husband, this is about, um, when was Craig? Four years Four ago. years ago. So we had a client that we did some business with, and uh, I think when he came to us, he was already... He was in trouble. He was already in trouble with these these predatory loans that we're talking about. 
And Daryl, time and time again, was saying, okay, let, let's figure this out. Let's, let's get you out of this. And I kid you not, would you say that it was to him uh, these loans were like a drug? He was, ad- he he was, was addicted. <laughs> they, were like, they were like crack cocaine. Once you get on them, you can't get off them. At one time, he had seven of these loans stacked on top of each other. And I'm not talking about $5,000. I'm talking mm-hmm. about six and seven figure loans until one day it just, the whole house came crashing yeah. down. I'm like, I told you this was going to happen if you would have just listened to me. But, you know, some people are just, you know, they know more than you do. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, <laughs> then I, I walked away with a clear conscience, which is what I mean. I wanted to help him save his business, but he was his own worst enemy. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, we can't help everybody, right? They're not always willing to listen. But uh, just the fact that we, we take this consultative approach, and, and it's sad that you're telling me that that's a unique thing that you guys do. It's sad that that's the case, right? It's something that everybody in your industry should be doing. But unfortunately, they're just they're seeing their clients as a number and, and wanting to just well, roll through. It's, a, it's a business that you can get into very inexpensively. Okay, you can be a credit. You can own your own credit repair company for a hundred fifty dollars down and forty nine dollars a month. So it you you get a lot of people just coming out of the woodwork that that's they can make that happen, and then they start talking to friends and family and neighbors, and and once that wears off or they've exhausted that. Um, uh, those capabilities then they don't know what to do so they start stories and and get on social media and you know it's just it's what it is i mean they, they just and so that gives us a bad name um our our credentials are we'll hit we've we've i think we've hit thirty seven thousand credit repairs um in uh 17 over 17 years uh last month we haven't done the exact totals yet uh with that we've had three complaints of which two were bogus and one i was just having a bad day and dropped the ball okay so i would take 100 percent responsibility of it but in an industry that is one of the top three most complained about industries to the ftc and the bbb and we've got one legit complaint over thirty-seven thousand. we think we're doing okay yeah and that's not including the over five thousand business loans that we've done for business owners over the years as well. So uh, like you said, we're pretty proud of that. But to your point, it's interesting because so you've got the credit restoration business that is, I think, the most complained about uh, industry as a whole to the FTC, right? And then because there are, like you said, there are a lot of people out there that are, you know, not telling the truth. Let's just put it that way. And then you have the the predatory loan business, and what's interesting is that there are plenty of people out there that you know in the country that are that do what we do as far as business loans, but most of them are going after the A paper loans, the the really the great credit, the you know the hundred at least making a hundred grand a year. That's what everybody wants, right? But those are not as easy to come by. Most people are not in that position. And so a lot of where, there, where a lot of companies will just throw the, those other clients that are you know under 700 credit and not making 100 grand, they just throw them away. And there is a whole huge portion of the majority of the population of business owners, I would say, that don't fall into that category. So that's where we've kind of taken our expertise and, and our you know and our integrity, if you will, and kind of developed that system. Because again, yeah, and then the people that are taking the the C and D paper over here on these predatory loans. Again, they have no conscience. Most of them, <laughs> and we're so they just let them go. Right. We're yeah. very proud of the fact that for, you know, when it comes to Better Business Bureau, um, it's virtually impossible to be a credit repair organization and have an A plus rating, and uh, unless you want to be accredited. Well, I think. Being accredited as as paying for something like that isn't the right thing to do. So we've never been accredited with the Better Business Bureau, and I know it drives them crazy. I get calls monthly 
about accreditation and they still have to give us an A plus rating and, and, <laughs> and they just and, and we're one of the only credit repair companies in the country that has an A plus rating with the BBB, which you know, the BBB is a little interesting too, but it's still it's a benchmark or or it's a baseline and, and uh we're very proud of that. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is y- you're right. It is impressive with what you guys do that that's that that's the case. Yeah. So before we jump into the next question I have for you about card stacking, because I think most people have no idea what, what that means and how it works, but how about just give us one one little piece of advice that somebody, a business owner that's listening, can do to improve their credit? Oh, geez, there's so many. Um. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll step start, in. Yeah. yeah, I'll step in. Um, a, I, I'll give you two. A, pay your bills on time. And that doesn't mean put them in the mail on the day they're due. That means a week before they're due, put them in the mail. Or, you know, there's no reason today to not pay your bills electronically and have minimum payments set up for automatic. And then if you can pay more, pay more. Uh, That's number one. Number two, um, a... A very odd thing about credit is lenders like to see, uh, lenders like to lend money to people that already have a lot of credit, because it 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 indicates to them if you've got a a Visa card with a twenty five thousand dollar limit, and you go to the the next to Mastercard to get a card. MasterCard's going to see that somebody else, that Visa has already dipped their toe into your swimming pool and tested the waters, right? And so they're much more apt to give you, provided you've made your payments on time and your score is where it is, uh, or where it's supposed to be, they're much more apt to give you money. So, you know, um, 30% of your credit score is building credit, and, and building your personal credit and, and, you know, just keep track of your payments and then constantly be looking to increase your limits, whether it's just calling, you know, your current creditors or whatever it is. But as high a limits as you can get and as low of utilization of those limits, that's, that's the number one thing that we see that, that, America, as a rule, doesn't understand what's called credit utilization ratio. Mm-hmm. And that is, it has nothing to do with debt to income. It has nothing to do with your mortgage or your car. It's simply all of your revolving credit. That's credit cards. If you have a $1,000 limit and you've charged $500, your utilization ratio is 50%. Guess what? That tells future creditors that you're shaky. Whereas if you have a thousand dollar limit and you spent 200 and made all your payments on time, you're perfect. Yep. And that's just to expand on that. That's one of the things we see a lot with small business owners is that a lot of times, you know, especially in a startup situation, business owners will utilize their personal credit cards to start their businesses. And what happens is when they don't understand the ramifications of maxing those credit cards out. So that, like he said, to just expand on that, you know, if you're looking to grow or expand your business or start a business, you need to consult with someone that knows what they're talking about. Because if you max out your personal credit cards and you're gonna ex- you're gonna grow to a point, and then you're gonna want to go for money to get keep growing, and you're stuck yep. unless you can come up with the money to pay down that utilization and a lot of times you know if it's 50 100 grand you know, max out credit cards that's a lot uh easier said than done to, to just simply pay that off or and pay it down and, and let me give yeah. you a really graphic example of that and this is personal because we use my credit okay so our team we use our own credits to test a lot of things and we came up with a, a product uh, a year and a half ago, and part of that was was figuring out how your score reacted to high credit utilization ratios. When we started, my score is at 780, and it went, and I maxed out a whole bunch of stuff. And um, my score went all the way down to 535. So think about that. I couldn't buy a toothpick on credit, but we had prepared for it, and we've done okay, so we have some money in the bank, what have you. But it went all the way down to 535. 
Then we slowly, over the past year, well, December of 19, we started this. So, so yeah, about a year and a half, we've slowly pay the max off on this, pay the minimum payments on this, you know, and we've just been experimenting to now, I think my ratio is down to 23%, and my average score across the board is 796. So it's went back up and more. And when I, and we're just talking, you know, actually on the way here, that I'll be, I'm going to, you know, finish my, our whatever we were doing and uh, uh, get that utilization down to, you know, 5%. And my score will probably be in the 830s, 840-ish, something like that. So so it's very personal. We do this, when we tell somebody, go do this, it isn't based on something we've read. It's something that we've tested ourselves. Credit repair, there's things that are, you know, the law is the law. But with a lot of things with Midas, just like what, you know, if we talk about our car, stacking and stuff today uh you know this is all stuff we've tested ourselves yeah no i so that was actually the piece of advice i was looking for because i i happen to know that that's a big part of your credit score and i also happen to know that most people don't realize that it's a big part of their credit score and it gives me an opportunity to uh, throw my dad's favorite line in there when you know my dad was an entrepreneur small business owner not a huge enterprise nothing you know didn't even wasn't even anything to sell by the time he retired but uh, you know, he took care of our family as, as we as we grew up with this small business. But he said to me all the time, Austin, my credit is so bad, I have to show two forms of ID to pay cash. <laughs> 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 right? And so, I, you know, I, and there's a reality to that. I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of business owners are in that position for that very reason. Right. He's he's using his lines. He's using his personal credit to qualify for a line of credit at the supply house. My, my dad was a stucco contractor. Right. So the supply house shows a balance on there. You got the credit cards that show the balance on there, the gas cards, all these th- types of things that have a constant balance on them. And he's paying off enough to then be able to use it for the next month. But the balance at the statement date was always showing high. Mm-hmm. So the he's credit a hamster score was on the wheel. Yep. yep. But, you know, it's interesting, though, because that's like you said, that's a very common problem with business owners. But there's also the opposite problem with very successful business owners that are very cat, you know, they're liquid and they have a lot of cash right and this was with my father he (coughs) excuse me after when i was looking to rebuild my credit after i filed bankruptcy and uh and daryl's helping me and i'm learning and doing all these things and one of the things so my dad i asked my dad i said can you please buy me a car and i'm gonna get go on the loan and i'm gonna have you co-sign on the loan so i can start building back up my credit do you know what he said why why can't i just pay cash i don't understand the man had so much money and he was so successful which is great that but it but it's interesting especially in today's you know world you know what do they say cash is king but we say i like to say credit gives you power because you might as well leverage other people's money to grow and expand if you can and keep your cash in the bank or invest it with you or yeah. you know what I mean or something else. Yeah, it, it, it can be used smartly, mm-hmm. right? I mean, my, my father-in-law is an engineer, very frugal man, uh, has been successful because of that, right. right? And when we first got married, he said to me, smart people earn interest, dumb people pay interest, right? right? <laughs> and, you know, there's, there's a lot of truth to that, yep. but there is a smart way to use credit. And the reality is if you don't have any credit and you haven't built any credit, you know, you can't buy your first house. Nope. You can't, you know, all those sorts of things are, are super important. I told you I've got a 21-year-old and a 17-year-old. In the last six months, we both g- we got car loans for both of them where they're, I'm co-signing so they can qualify for the credit to start to build their own credit because it's going to be important, right? Now, you made a point earlier in the conversation as well where you said, we're coming out of school, college or high school, and not understanding how our credit works, not understanding the financial system that we all live and breathe in every day, right? My kids both went through calculus in high school for math, (laughs) but neither one of them know how to balance a checkbook. Neither one of them understand how a car loan or a mortgage loan work. You know, so it, it's it's the basic financial principles that aren't being taught, and so the re- all of our society suffers because we don't understand how the financial system works. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's you know, I like to always say, 
from my perspective, your credit score is the second most important number in your adult life bes behind your social security number. And if you don't have a score or you or your score is suffering and uh, then you have you're going to have an issue. Again, most people don't have the luxury of having tons of cash in the bank to pay for everything. It's just not how the world works these days. And uh, I totally agree with you. It's so important to to for these, you know, I <laughs> Again, going back to myself, I had a great credit score coming out of college, right? I was so, so similar to what you're doing with the car loan. Um, you know, my dad ha put me on as an authorized user on a credit card when I was in college to help, you know, pay my bills and things of that nature, but also was building me credit. But again, my dad didn't really have any idea that that was actually happen happening, yeah. right? It just did. And then I had my, uh, my, you know, I had good credit. I got out on my own, had my first job. I was paying my bills late, right? But I was paying them within the 30-day window, so I still had a great credit score. But again, I was, you know, early 20s, had no education, nobody ever taught me what why this was happening. So I was paying late fees every month. And to me, but it didn't it didn't even phase me because I had no idea what was actually happening. And then it wasn't until you know, my my personal situation where I ended up in the bankruptcy that I started to really learn and understand how it works and it's yeah it's so important it's just you know we're passionate about it and i wish that there were more opportunities for and i think there's things they're starting to develop courses and things that people can take but it should be taught in schools like you said yeah it's kind of part of our long-term plan um as blair slowly takes over the company here in the next year year and a half or takes a more active role, let's say, um, we're going to do some things on credit education that we started a couple years ago and then just kind of got sidetracked and, and now we're, we're back on to, it's, it's, it's criminal. The, it, it really is that, that this kids are coming out of school and they have no idea how it works. They don't, they have no idea. And it's really not that hard. You know, I, I've written a couple books. One of them is on credit. I literally wrote it so a fifth grader could understand it. It's a 125-page ebook that has everything between my ears on credit is in that book. You know, and we get, we sold, I don't know, like 8,000 copies at 47 bucks a piece, and I think I gave 12,000 to the military, you know, and, and just stuff like that. And, and the stories we get back are, wow, this is amazing. I never knew this. I never, I just didn't understand, you know, and so, yeah. Yeah. All right, so I want to get to card stacking. Okay. So tell us, <laughs> tell us what that is first and then how you kind of pioneered that uh, in the industry okay so yeah I'll, I'll start and i'll let blair finish it because i kind of do other things in the company and her and our other partner wes hi wes um <laughs> out there are are really do most of that so in in the beginning i i think i said that in you know unsecured lending as we know it today really started in 2000 the, the summer to the fall of 2003 I was messing around with it right around Christmas time, which is what, this is how I got my loan, and um, uh, and founded the company in April of, of 2004. Now, coincidentally, that was the onset of fix and flipping. Fix and flipping started, and now it's the nationwide rage and has been for the longest time, but that really started in 2003 and 2004. And Den Denver, where I was living at the time, was a hotbed of that activity. And at that time, every bank in the world had a $50,000 or $100,000 line of credit and or credit card. And if you had a 680 credit score and I could feel your pulse, that was it. You got the money. So we're sitting there, and and people uh, were coming to us, and they're like, "Great, I really like the fifty thousand, but I, that means I still have to use hard money to buy the property, and then I can use the fifty thousand to rehab the property. Is there any way you can get me two hundred thousand, and then I can buy the property and have the fifty to fix it?" 
So we got the, and the credit system itself wasn't as sophisticated as it what as it is today. Now you apply for a credit card that inquiries on your credit report instantaneously. Back then it took 24 to 36 hours for that credit card to show up or that inquiry to show up. So we got the bright idea or theory or whatever you want to call it that let's stack a bunch of these on top of each other. We'll fill out multiple applications and we'll turn all the applications into the various banks. It wasn't against any law. The banks don't really like it, but it is, like my wife said earlier, 25% of the capital that is obtained by small business owners today is through card and loan stacking. That's just what it is. Think about that number, how huge it is. And so we literally had a room this big, and we had 12 fax machines in it, and each one was speed dialed to a different bank. So we'd fill these applications out. We would call the banks and say, or our, our, our person at, we had a different special person at each bank and say, we're, we're sending an app. You need to deal with it right now. And as soon as we got the okay from all of them, uh, the admin in our office would just go press buttons, at however many we were stacking on top of each other. And that was how rudimentary or archaic it was. We were sending anywhere from three to 12 faxes of app bank applications and everybody was getting approved. So when that young lady brought my uh, checkbook in for $125,000, we were getting people $500,000, $600,000, $700,000 by stacking these loans. So once we started stacking the loans and that worked, um, we started stacking credit cards. So we'd get the loans done, but then we'd do the credit cards like the next day. So we were getting people literally high six and seven figures with our average back then was $500,000 and we were getting paid three points. I mean, we were printing money. And uh, yeah, it was, it, that's, that's how it all started. Um, Midas put, built the first um, website that was on the internet for loan stacking. Actually, the world famous internet mar marketer um, uh, Armin Morin built that for us. And then we also built the first card stacking website about a month later uh, that was created by the same guy, uh, Marty Dickinson, if you're watching or listening, Marty, um, that uh, uh, he also wrote the book Internet Marketing for Dummies. So he had a good pedigree. So those, these were the type of guys that we were hanging around with at that time. So we had the first websites on the Internet. We were just killing it. And then the crash happened, and all of the banks pulled those those products. But today, it's it's we still have a piece of software that we simultaneously apply, and and uh, and, and we have other tricks that are proprietary that you know I'm not going to mention. But uh, yeah, we're and, and things contract and expand. Um, but yeah, we're 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 doing okay. And I don't know what more you want me to add. That was a pretty good explanation. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it just it, it's entrepreneurs have a voracious appetite for cash. And if they have if they, you know, the alternative is to go to the SBI. There's no such thing as a traditional line of credit unless you're a multimillion dollar business. So the alternative is going to be to go to the SBA and get a couple hundred fifty thousand bucks okay great you can do that with good credit but they're also going to want it collateralized at least one to one and usually two or three to one so they want the business they want them in this order the business your house your car your wife your firstborn <laughs> daughter and then they keep going after that they want everything you have so now you have handcuffs on that you can never do anything until those liens or UCCs are taken off whatever you know they they've put on. So the unsecured markets are a little bit more expensive, but if you look at an SBA loan, that by the time it's all said and done, you're paying five to six points versus the unsecure and you're, you're collateralizing everything two and three times over versus the unsecured markets where you're paying eight to 12 points, but you own everything. I mean, you can literally go out and get $250,000 
and buy a Ferrari and drive off into the sunset and they'll wreck your credit. But guess what? They're never going to own your Ferrari. Yeah. He's not encouraging that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's the disclaimer we'll put at the end of right. this. That's not what we encourage. Well, really quick, <laughs> let me just add one more thing that yeah. he didn't mention. So when like I had someone at yesterday at, say, well, wh- how, why would a business owner pay, you know, 10 points? pay to, to get that and i and i so first of all it's the between secured and unsecured is a huge difference like he said but other the other thing a lot of people don't understand or they don't know if you get say you get a hundred thousand dollars just for round numbers in f- stacked cards maybe four of them so twenty five thousand dollars piece and you're utilizing them and you're revolving them so say in a fix and flip situation right so you use that because pretty much anything nowadays except for maybe a house payment or a rent payment for for a business um, building or whatnot lease payment and a car payment you can charge on a credit card yeah so you can use you could charge so while you're waiting to flip this house and you're 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 using all buying all your supplies and everything that you're doing to 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 take care of that and so you're maybe i don't know i don't know how long it really takes three to four months for rehabbing a house generally maybe so you're you you charge up the card then you pay it off when the house sells so now you've revolved the card once you've done this a couple times the next thing you know the banks are like we really like you you're doing exactly what we want you to do and guess what we're gonna up your limits so now you've started at a hundred thousand now maybe you're at 150 175 thousand and they didn't have to pay us for that Right. That was that was free, if you will. Yeah. And the other portion is all most of these cards, almost all of them nowadays have zero percent interest for uh, zero to I'm sorry, 15 to 22 months. So you if you do it correctly and you, you know, you plan it out right, it can be a, a huge benefit. Yeah. And a lot of times with those 15 to 22 months, uh, when they start charging you, you can go back to them. And we actually have a business where we do that, where we'll go back on your behalf and say, hey, look at that. We've been a good customer. They've revolved the cards four or five times in the in 15 months. And uh, you need to cut them a break and they'll give you another 15 months. We've we've had a couple cards where the people have went 48 months at zero percent interest. Mm-hmm. So think about that you know, or, or the listeners should think about that is is it expensive to get this money yeah it's expensive but if you consider the alternative number one and if you do it how you're supposed to and continue to revolve these cards um you're you're getting raised limits and each time you revolve it it's like getting a brand new loan you know, so it's it, it really works. It really works out well, and it's it's again. I you know they they call us the Godfather of this industry, which is you no, know they call you the uh, Godfather, which, <laughs> which is 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 interesting when you're in public and you get recognized, and you know we're kind of low key people, but it, it, it's fun. But yeah, what what was a started out as a theory today now I. I wish I would have trademarked. If I would have trademarked it, we'd be doing this interview on our deserted island in the Caribbean, (laughs) right? Unfortunately, we didn't do that way back then. But it is, it's an outstanding way for business owners to stay solvent, expand, and grow. And if you do it how we teach it, You'll never get into trouble. And our, I mean, if you look at our reviews spread across the Internet, uh, people really seem to appreciate what we do. Yeah. Well, you guys are clearly passionate about what you do and, and providing needed financial support to business, uh, to business owners in our country, which we take our hat off to you for. Um, we are up against time, so I'm just going to turn to Blair and say, tell us how people can get a hold of you if they uh, are in need of, of your support. Yeah, absolutely. So... Uh, if you need any help, you can go to MidasBizLoans.com. Uh, there's a contact us form and a get started form if you're looking for you know, financing. Um, if you want to reach out to me directly, you can visit MeetBlair, B-L-A-I-R.com. All of my contact information, LinkedIn, Instagram, all, everything is, is there. And then also we have an 800 number. Daryl, did you want to share that? 800 756 Five three four zero. So, again, there's all sorts of ways. Also, if you search, well, 
Hornbacher is a mouthful. That's our last name. So I don't. I'm, but if you search us, you'll find us. We're there. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for being here, guys. I really appreciated the time, and I uh, look forward to watching your careers uh, as they continue to blossom. Awesome. Thank you, thank you so much. It. This was really awesome. Yeah. Thank you. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast platform.